Hello and welcome to our Bible class for uh, January 15th, uh, 2023. And we are continuing to look at the Book of Concord, looking at the first contents of it, the three ecumenical creeds. Uh, and so we'll look at uh, Luther's hymn that, uh, based on the, on the Apostles' Creed, uh, to open and close. We all believe in one true God who created earth and heaven, the Father who to us in love has the right of children given. He in soul and body feeds us, all we need his hand provides us. Through all snares and perils leads us, watching that no harm betide us. He cares for us by day and night, all things are governed by his might. We all believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, possessing. An equal Godhead, throne in might, source of every grace and blessing. Born of Mary, Virgin Mother, by the power of the Spirit. Word made flesh, our elder brother, that the lost might life inherit. Was crucified for all our sin and raised by God to life again. All right. And so again, we're talking about the three ecumenical creeds. Uh, and every book of Concord starts with these. Now, again, first kind of defining what uh, ecumenical, it comes from the uh, Greek word. Uh, it means the inhabitants, and it usually was used by Greeks to um, indicate where there was Greek culture as opposed to where there were barbarians. So there's us and the other people, which we see, of course, uh, in Jews and Gentiles or in uh, some Native American uh, languages and, and other groups as well. There's always kind of just an us and a not us. Um, and so that's ecumenical. But then early Greek Christians took this word that meant us and not us, and use it to mean all Christians as opposed to non-Christians. Um, and so again, so these, these three creeds then end up uh, being used to define what a Christian is, uh, who a Christian is, you know, what Christians believe. So why start with the creeds? Well, they, the Book of Concord begins with the creeds because it's meant to be common ground. Uh, this is kind of common ground for Christians before we get into the specifics of the Lutheran distinctions that we fought, that we find in the other documents. Uh, and that this reminds us, too, that the Book of Concord views itself in light of the creeds of the ancient church. Um, that, and uh, all of the, document of the documents that follow uh, all quote from at least one of the creeds, um, or at least, at least mention them as a basis for things. And so, again, the uh, the authors of all of the other thing of the other writings in the Book of Concord then understand that they're united with the faith of the whole Christian Church. Um, and as we'll see uh, in the coming weeks, when we look at the Book of Con or look at the Augsburg Confession, Augsburg Confession is almost, in a sense, seen as seen as a creed. Um, although the reformers tend to use um, creed from comes from a Latin word, meaning I believe. Uh, but the Greek word uh, symbol is used to, uh, is what the reformers tend to use to refer to the creeds. Um, and so uh, the Augsburg Confession itself even follows kind of the, the order of things found out in the, in the creeds, starting with God and creation, moving to Christ, then the Holy Spirit, and then finally church sacraments and resurrection, that thing. Um, and the, in putting creeds in Lutheran, uh, in books of doctrine, dates at least to uh, Corpus Doctrinae Philicum. So that's a collection of writings about uh, of doctrine from uh, Philip Melanchthon um, in 1560. And um, yeah, the ba collection of Philip Melanchthon's writings that became the basic doctrinal text for Electoral Saxony. And con this practice continued in later Lutheran collections as well. Again, their inclusion underscores the deep conviction among evangelical theologians. Uh, this is evangelical not in the way that Amer we refer, refer to American evangelicals, uh, but evangelical is how Luther referred to him. Luther and the other reformers tended to refer to themselves as they didn't. Uh, that again, that the reformate, so they refer to themselves as evangelical, focusing on the good news on the gospel. Um, because showing that the Reformation, far from breaking with the ancient church, upholds, upheld and recovered the chief teachings of the universal Christian faith. So you start with the, they start with the creeds to show that they're still within the historic Christian church that way. And then as they go through, uh, we'll find, you know, again in the Augsburg Confession uh, and, some, and the other documents that they're not necessarily, they're not trying to create new things. They're showing how 
the reformers have rediscovered or, uh, you know, reemphasized doctrines, the ideas that were have been present in the church since the beginning that had been flawed or corrupted or covered o- up uh, by the Roman Catholic Church, church of the day. Um, and so again, throughout the history of the church, people have witnessed to the gospel as the creed spare testimony. All right. So again, the three creeds are the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. Um, here, here's the Apostles' Creed, um, and here's allegedly uh, a depiction of the Apostles uh, writing the creed, which is uh, you know how how it was thought to happen. Again, the text of the Apostles' Creed probably took its present shape in the eighth century. It represents a final redaction of the old Roman Creed, first attested to the West in the early third century. Um, and the Latin Church used the Old Roman Creed as its baptismal creed. And when we talk about Latin Church, that's kind of Western Church, Greek Church, uh, Eastern Church, just a shorthand for how they how we do that. Um, so again, it's it's at least from at least the third early third century, if not earlier. Um, but probably its present shape, seventh eighth century. Uh, and it, it was used for baptism, which is how we still use it. Uh, its content and fu- function match those of similar creeds used in other churches throughout the Roman Empire. Um, parts of the older creed uh, were opposed to or were opposed by certain Gnostic alternatives to Orthodox Christianity by stressing the identity of the Creator with the Father of Jesus Christ, Christ's birth in the flesh, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of the flesh. Um, and unlike in the Eastern Church, where local baptismal creeds slowly gave way to the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed maintained its authority in widespread use, supported especially by its place in Western baptismal liturgies. So again, so the Apostles' Creed continues to be used in the Western Church. Uh, again, I would say that's our, our practice here uh, of use the Apostles' Creed for, for baptisms. Uh, Whereas it's, and then we use the Nicene Creed, as we'll talk about later, for when uh, when we celebrate Holy Communion, which is why we, that tends to be the one we say the most most often. Uh, but uh, in the in the Greek Church, in the Eastern Church, uh, they tended to focus on the Nicene Creed. Uh, as early as Rufinus's exposition of the Old Roman Creed in 404, and maybe earlier. Uh, legend was propagated of the creed's apostolic origins, where an apo- each apostle contributed a separate article. So there's you can divide the creed into twelve spots, twelve phrases, and so each apostle contributed a phrase. Of course, in the 15th century, so when the reformers are setting up the Book of Concord, this story had come into attack. Uh, probably more accurate than to say that the creed reflects the appropriation of apostolic teaching by the early church. Um, and again, we'll touch on more, the, more on the Apostles' Creed uh, when we talk about the catechisms as well, because Luther uses the creed as kind of the basis uh, for the catechism. Uh, and uh, also just kind of a, a note as we're, as we're looking at this, um, the translations of these creeds I, I'm using are right from the, from the Cole Boyert, uh translation that we talked about earlier. Um, and, but so there's going to be some spots that sound a little different from what we use. Um, and so in, in English-speaking churches, there's generally three sources for how the Apostles' Creed is going to be found, printed in the hymnal or whatever. There's the traditional one, uh, which we find in our hymnals uh, and was in the earlier blue hymnal. Uh, the translation from the International Consultation of, on English Texts. Uh, and if you've been to a the ELCA church or uh, a church that used the green hymnal. Uh, that's what they used. Um, or there's a new, the English language liturgical consultation um, that the ELCA hymnal supplement used. Um, so again, the translations here from uh, that we find as we're looking at them here in the Book of Concord are from uh, based on the Latin version of the Book of Concord. Uh, connected, attested before 753, um, and there's footnotes that kind of note where thing, this diverges from other things. Um, I, didn't full, I didn't cover most of those, but we'll, um, if you're interested, I can, we can go back and point those out. Um, and so this is how <coughs> the Book of Concord introduces the Apostles' Creed. 
says, the first confession or creed is the common confession of the apostles in which the foundation is laid for the Christian faith. It reads as follows. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, uh, again, we usually say maker, uh, but creator is sometimes used. Uh, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. Uh, and we'll talk more about this descent to hell uh, when we get to the formula of Concord uh, too. Um, yeah. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into the heavens. He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. Um, you know, our, we tend to use Christian uh, to define ourselves against the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but originally Catholic means universal, so that's used in other translations. Uh, or, you know, as a carryover, not, in, not a translation. Uh, Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the flesh, and the life everlasting. Amen. Again, the, do you use flesh or do you use body? Um, you know, similar. Just slight, slight different nuances, not necessarily uh, hugely uh, doctrine-defining misunderstandings there. All right, uh, then we get to the Nicene Creed, the second creed. Um, and here's Emperor Constantine along with the theologians um, with, with that in Greek there. Um, and we touched on this um, back over the summer too. Um, but so in 325, Emperor Constantine's troubled by disunity in the church caused by Christological disputes between bishops such as Athanasius of Alexandria and the Arians. And so he calls for a synod for a meeting of bishops to meet in Nicaea to formulate a unified response. Um, and so 300 bishops gather mostly from the East. They're Greek speaking. Uh, they're mostly because here they're gathering in Nicaea that's right outside of Constantinople. Um, so it's easier for the Greek speaking ones to get there. Uh, again, called in uh, 325, tries to get different groups to agree because he, now that he is trying to make Christianity the um, the official religion of the empire, it would be helpful if there was just one Christianity and not multiple ones. So he's trying to get everyone to agree. Uh, and again, the big challenge is especially about this guy named Arius and his teachings. Uh, even though he'd been excommunicated, he still had lots of followers. Um, and so his, and his focus was that God is one and indivisible, so therefore the Son is a creature though a perfect creature. The sun's created outside of time and before anything else was created and the sun is not truly God, which that's part of what then causes the issues with, uh, with what we understand, how we understand this to work now. That, and so that's what the Nicene Creed ends up focusing on is how the person of Jesus. Uh, and then it's, Council of Nicaea is in 325, but uh, the Council of Constantinople in 381 uh, reaffirms everything because uh, there had been issues um, based on who the emperor was and who the emperor was listening to and how orthodox they were, um, or whether, whether they were orthodox or Arian, and how they had agreed that. Um, and so again, it kind of starts off as a took the Apostles' Creed, took a bat, one of the baptismal creeds as a example, and then added some phrases that make sure that the anti-Arian phrases against the, the Arian heresy. Um, and then they again, uh, in 381, the Council of Constantinople includes some refinements, especially regards to the Holy Spirit, uh, to combat the Numantomachians' rejection of the Holy Spirit's full divinity, um, again, pneumatos, uh, same root word um, that we have for like pneumatic stuff, meaning air. Uh, in Greek as in Hebrew, uh, air, uh, breath, spirit are all the same word. Um, so that's just a fancy word for this way to describe this group that's dealing with the Holy Spirit. Because again, pneumatos, uh, spirit. All right, and then the uh, later two later councils. Uh, of Ephesus and Chalcedon reaffirm this Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, which we call the Nicene Creed because it's a lot easier to say. Um, 
And again, the Eastern Church and in the West, it creed came to have a more central place in the Eucharistic liturgy. So we use it when it gets used when there's the celebration of Holy Communion. Um, and then influenced by Augustine's Trinitarian theology, emphasized the equality of the three persons of the Trinity. Uh, start They it's later add the Filioque Clause to the third article who proceeds from the Father and the Son uh, that then... Um, against the influence of Arianism in the West, but the, the, uh, by the time of the Great Schism in the 11th century, this becomes a big issue. Um, that the Eastern churches wanted the original Nicene uh, Creed pre preserved without the Filioque, and the, La the Western church said that, well, no, it reflects, we need to emphasize the tr unity of the Trinity, so we have to have it in. All right. Uh, and again, here, here it is. Um, again, this is the translation from the Book of Concord based on the Latin version. Um, it'll be pretty similar, but not quite exact to what we'd say. Uh, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things seen and unseen, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten of the Father before all the ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made. For us human beings, and for our salvation, he came down from the heavens, and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became a human being. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into the heavens, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is coming again with glory to judge the living and the dead, there will be no end to his kingdom. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and life giver who proceeds from the Father and the Son, that's the filioque clause there, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so again, that's the Nicene Creed. And we're not going to, not a whole lot of difference uh, in translation there, but there's a, there are a few little things. All right. Uh, and then the Athanasian Creed, or the one called the Creed of St. Athanasius, which he made against the heretics called Arians, and which reads as follows. Um, but we're going to talk about it again a little first. Um, so it's a, originally written in Latin, um, so not as old as the other two. But uh, so this Latin profession of faith, certainly not written by Athanasius as the reformers following medieval tradition still thought. It originated in the Western Church and reflects Augustinian and Ambrosian Trinitarian theology. Again, look from Augustine and Ambrose, um, two of those early church fathers. Often called the Quicoke Volt, and I butchered that, but that's okay. So after its first line, uh, it most likely arose in southern Gaul, modern-day France, during the 5th century and gained popularity in the West at the time of Charlemagne. Um, as other important texts were also becoming more important, more widely used, such as the Apostles' Creed and the Te Deum. You know, that we praise you, O God, uh, that we, we sing sometimes. Uh, the lengthy form of the Athanasian Creed, complete with anathemas, the condemnations against heretical teaching, resembles the, less the spare contours of the other two creeds and more an expanded comment on particular theological issues or a confession of faith. So it's again, it's long because it it deals specifically with this Arian understanding of who Jesus is and how Jesus works. And so clarifying that against some of the other beliefs that have popped up. Uh, and so this translation employs the language of the text of the creeds and the original languages referring to the German or Latin versions where important variations occur. All right. uh, and we say the Athanasian Creed generally once a year on Trinity Sunday, so late May, early June. Um, because it's really, really long. All right. Um, and again, this is what it says. Whoever wants to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and inviolate will doubtless perish eternally. This, however, is the Catholic faith, that we worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the person of the Father is one, that of the Son another, and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. What the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son's uncreated, the Holy Spirit is uncreated. Remember, 
Arius taught that the sun was created, the first thing created, but it's created nonetheless. Um, so this condemns that. The Father is unlimited, the Son's unlimited, the Holy Spirit's unlimited. The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal. Uh, and yet there are not three eternal beings, but one who is eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or unlimited beings, but one who is uncreated and unlimited. In the same way, the Father's almighty, the Son's almighty, the Holy Spirit's almighty, and yet there are not three almighty beings, but one who is almighty. Thus, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. Thus, the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Uh, for just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, so we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there are three gods or three lords. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten by anyone. The Son is from the Father alone, not made or created, but begotten. The Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son, not made or created or begotten, but proceeding. Therefore there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity none is before or after greater or less than another, but all three persons are in themselves co-eternal and co-equal, so that as has been stated above in all things, the Trinity and unity and the unity and Trinity must be worshipped. Therefore whoever wants to be saved should think thus about the Trinity. But it is necessary for eternal salvation that one also faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore it is the true faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at once God and a human being. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and a human being, born of the substance of his mother in this age. He is perfect God and a perfect human being composed of a rational soul and human flesh. He is equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and a human being, nevertheless he is not two, but one Christ. However, he is, not, he is one not by the changing of the divinity into the flesh, but by the taking up of the humanity in God. Indeed, he is one not by a confusion of substance, but by a unity of person. For as the rational soul and the flesh are one human being, so God and the human being are one Christ. He suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose from the dead, ascended into the heavens, is seated at the right hand of the Father, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. And as coming all human beings will rise with their bodies and will give an account of their own deeds. Those who have done good things will enter into eternal life and those who have done evil things into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. A person cannot be saved without firmly believing this Firm, believing this firmly and faithfully. And so again, uh, this is why the Book of Concord begins with these creeds um, to show that they are within the Catholic faith and they're not doing anything, some, anything strange or unusual or breaking with tradition. But they are a part of the Catholic faith and no longer, and don't, these, anath these anathemas no, don't apply to them. All right, so we'll conclude with the last verse of uh, Luther's Creed hymn. We all confess the Holy Ghost, who in highest heaven dwelling, with God the Father and the Son, comforts us beyond all telling, who the church, his own creation, keeps in unity of spirit. Here forgiveness and salvation daily come through Jesus' merit. All flesh shall rise, and we shall be in bliss with God eternally. Thank you very much for listening and watching.